thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the invitation in particular to CH Open and Y Computing. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to um, present version two of the CERN Open Hardware License. Uh, my name is Javier Serrano, and I lead a team of developers at CERN who uh, do mostly electronics and low-level software for the controls of the particle accelerators. So uh, before I start, um, just a very quick disclaimer. I, I don't have any kind of legal training and everything that I've learned uh, in the 10 plus years I have learned by discussing with colleagues and in particular with lawyers who have helped uh, in the uh, in solving a number of uh, open hardware issues and in the collaboration I've ha I have had with lawyers for the drafting of the CERN open hardware license. So uh, you should take the following with a pinch of salt and in particular you should not take it as legal advice. Uh, but I, I hope that uh, my perspective is useful, uh, especially for those of you who are not legal experts. Uh, I, I, I cannot make ma many assumptions about the audience. Uh, I guess there are among you people who already know licensing and people who are completely new to it. So I, I have tried to include material, uh, uh, basic material and a bit more advanced material at the end so that uh, everybody learns something new today, hopefully. Uh, before I start, I would like to say some words on the democratization of uh, hardware design in the last years. This is an example of a kid who was born with a malformation in his uh, hand and uh, he's using uh, a 3D printed prosthetic hand uh, made in a community called Enable. It's a community that design uh, prosthetic hands together and 3D print them together. And the particular bit here is that this hand has been designed by his mom. Uh, who doesn't have any kind of formal training in engineering or design. So this is just to illustrate that things that used to take a lot of effort and, and the, uh, the equivalent of a small and medium enterprise to, uh, to design uh, a few years back now can be done by hobbyists. And this is something uh, that has happened, as I say, quite, quite recently. And the combination of how easy it has become to do hardware and how useful it is uh, makes it important for people to come up with efficient ways of sharing hardware designs. And uh, as I will say later, a big source of inspiration for open hardware is the free and open source software world. And, and it, something similar happened in software at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s of the last century, where it became relatively simple for people to contribute software and software became very useful. And uh, therefore it became important to guarantee that it could be shared in an efficient way and in a legally sound manner. And this is when free and open source software was born and the licenses that come with it. So something similar has happened or is happening in hardware in these years. And that's why it is important to come up with uh, good licenses. So in this talk, I will start with a bit of um, setting the context. I will tell you about CERN very briefly. Then for those of you who are, who are new to, to the idea of licensing, I will speak about licensing basics. I will then move on to uh, explain what makes hardware particular so far as licensing is concerned and what are the issues that one finds when trying to draft a license for hardware. Then I will say how the CERN Open Hardware License deals with these issues. I will explain the license a bit and then um, I will move on to a bit more advanced material. I have selected three entries of our frequently asked questions and I will uh, answer to those questions and then I will open the floor for debate and uh, questions from the audience. So, uh, first of all, CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. We're located in the border between France and Switzerland, in Geneva. And um, uh, our main objective is to uh, conduct fundamental research in the field of particle physics. So find out more about the fundamental constituents of matter and their interactions. And um, we are like a factory and our end product is the particle beam. And uh, so we, we, uh, we provide a beam to our users, which are the physicists conducting the research. And to do that, we have like a production line, which is made of a sequence of particle accelerators. So particle go, particles go from one accelerator to another, to bigger and bigger accelerators until they hit the Large Hadron Collider, which is the biggest accelerator in the complex. 27 kilometer long, 150 meters underground, crosses the border four times, and then, uh, in four places around the LHC, 
there are there are counter rotating beams so one beam clockwise and one beam counterclockwise and the, these beams are made to collide in four different places around the accelerator and around those places uh, we have uh, so-called detectors which are themselves big engineering endeavors the size of cathedrals and again 100 meters underground uh, here you should picture the beam coming into the picture so one beam coming into the picture one beam coming out in the middle and the interaction point is in the center here uh, and whenever there's a collision uh, uh, secondary particles come out and they are detected and uh, the detectors uh, take this information serialize it out at rates up to one gigabyte per second during normal operation so enormous amounts of data which are stored offline uh, for later analysis by the physicists uh, as they try to unravel the mysteries of nature so in terms of mandate uh, CERN was created in, in very idealistic times and we are very proud of it after the World War uh, in the 50s. These are people meeting in Paris and uh, coming up with our mandate, which is this beautiful document called the CERN Convention, which was uh, drafted in 53 and which includes uh, in particular uh, this sentence about making uh, our results generally available. So CERN not only conducts fundamental research, but it is, it is part of the mandate to make all the results available and uh, further in the document it says that this is not only limited to physics results but to things that we design in the path in the path to those discoveries as well now for us working at cern it is very natural to ask ourselves the question of how to interpret that sharing mandate in the in the technological scene of the 21st century and many of us at cern have found that open source is a very efficient way of fulfilling that mandate so we have our friends in the software side who have been contributing to, to free and open source software for many years. Uh, people taking care of data, uh, take part in the open science movement to make uh, uh, experiments reproducible and, uh, and share their data under an open data paradigm. People in the publication side uh, do open access whereby the typical situation for publishing is reversed. The producers of content pay for the editing effort uh, in such a way that the readers have free access uh, for, uh, to the articles. And we on the hardware side uh, have found uh, that open hardware is a very efficient way of sharing our designs with the world. And of course, being at CERN, we're very proud that these four kinds of open are enabled uh, by an underlying technology that uh, uh, has enabled many other things in the world, which is a World Wide Web, which was also born at CERN. Now, when we started doing hardware more, open hardware more than 10 years ago, we uh, came up with a number of issues we uh, needed to solve. Uh, and um, they can be categorized very broadly in four categories. Each one of them would uh, could be the subject of a dedicated talk. Today I'm focusing on the fourth one in this list. Uh, but first of all, we needed to uh, have a place to share designs. Today it seems quite easy to just put something online in, in the many platforms that we have for sharing content. At the time it was not so evident. And uh, in particular, we also wanted to have a place where the quality of the designs was a bit curated uh, and that we could have a forum to, uh, of per project to establish a community around each one of the projects. So we created the open hardware repository. We also started discussing with commercial companies that had been doing uh, uh, collaborations with us uh, under a proprietary paradigm at, up to then. And then uh, we discussed with them about how they could do business with open source hardware. Uh, another very important component uh, is the uh, the use of free and open source software tools to design hardware. Uh, as opposed to the software world, uh, many of the tools we use to design hardware are proprietary and that poses a significant problem for the sharing because there are many chances that you publish a file and uh, it's in a format that people will not be able to open or edit because they, they don't have a license for the same tool that you use to come up with that file. And uh, a bit related with the uh, discussions with companies on business models, uh, there is something that companies um, try to avoid in general, which is legal uh, uncertainty. So it became quite evident from early on that we needed a, a set of licenses or a license to uh, establish the basis on which uh, this uh, sharing happens and to make it very, very clear what are the rules of the game. 
So I will be focusing on this fourth point today, and I will be talking about hardware licensing and the CERN Open Hardware License in particular. So some licensing basics before we uh, delve into, um, into uh, the CERN Open Hardware License particulars. Uh, first of all, uh, to give you some context uh, for uh, what a license is, uh, I need to tell you before about intellectual property. And I have uh, double quoted intellectual property because there are people who, who think that the word property uh, should not be used in this context. It is clearly a different kind of property in the sense that if I give you a car uh, and I had just one car, then at the end of the process, I have zero cars and you have one car. If I give you an idea, at the end of the process, I have one idea and you have one idea. So it's not exactly the same thing, but the fact is that everybody calls it or many, many people call it intellectual property de facto. So that's why I double quoted uh, to make uh, to, to acknowledge the fact that some people don't really agree with this use. But in any case, uh, in the tool set of the practitioner of intellectual property, there are three main tools. There are other tools, but the, the main three tools are copyright. And, uh, copyright deals primarily with the right to make copies. So if I do something creative, like a piece of writing, piece of poetry, for example, and I put it out there, uh, in principle, you don't have the right to make copies, to modify and distribute the modified versions or the original. So copyright is the right that regulates the, that making of copies. Uh, the second tool in the tool set is trademarks. It does something similar, but for brands and logos. So if I trademark my logo, you cannot use it without my consent. And the third very important part is patents. So if I have created something, uh, I, I have invented something. So imagine I'm somebody who's very inventive and I have invented a way of doing something in a very efficient way and I patent that invention, then I can exclude others from making, using or selling that invention uh, or any embodiment of that idea that I patented, irrespectively of whether the other person came up independently with the, with the same idea. If it's patented, they still don't have the right uh, to do these things, okay? Now, this is very important because a license is nothing else than a permission you give somebody to do something that they would otherwise not have the right to do. So you need to start with something that people would not have the right to do in principle. And that's where these uh, three tools in the tool set of the intellectual property practitioner come into play. Uh, the reason why that somebody might not have the right to do something might be copyright, might be patents, might be uh, trademarks or, or something else. There are other rights as well. But it is very important that you start with something that people don't have the right to do. Otherwise, the whole permission is, is, uh, is, is moot. There's, there's no reason uh, to give a license. And this is particularly important because sometimes you will give that permission. In fact, very often you will give that permission, but you will attach some obligations. So you will, you will give that permission conditionally, conditioned to the other person doing something. And uh, that doing something will be enforceable insofar as the other person did not have the right uh, to do something to begin with. Uh, otherwise, if, if he or she doesn't have to ask you permission for anything, uh, you cannot put any conditions on that permission, of course. So this is a very basic thing, but very important, uh, as we will see later. So about hardware licensing, okay, we are, uh, most of the practitioners at CERN and, and elsewhere, engineers, scientists, and, and we like to build on things that exist and are uh, uh, solid and uh, uh, established. So in the, in the field of licensing, of course, and in many other things in open hardware, we look at open source, free and open source software, and we try to get as much inspiration as we can, because of course, free and open source software has been very, very successful and it's running many of the things we, we use in, in our everyday lives. So um, in terms of licensing, if we look at the software world using that as our starting point, most of the licenses are uh, the licenses are copyright based, uh, and that's uh, very fortunate for the software people. They have copyright law which applies uniformly uh, in almost every country uh, to uh, software, both both in soft form and in source form and in the binary form, and uh, that makes it easy to draft licenses because you can rely on the fact that people don't have the right to copy uh, software in, in principle. So you can draft a license based on copyright and then you can attach obligations if you want on your on your granting of, of permissions. Um, 
Lately, patents have become a thing in software as well. So uh, modern licenses also give a license for patents insofar as they are needed to make use of the software and to guarantee certain freedoms for, for licensees. Through the years uh, in uh, open source, uh, free and open source software, uh, there has been uh, an evolution and uh, the types of sharing that people use have kind of converged on three main families, uh, which are represented by different types of licenses, of which I've given some examples here. In permissive licenses, so for example, if I publish a piece of code and I publish it under the Berkeley uh, license or the MIT license or Apache V2, which is the more modern of the family, if I, if I publish a, a piece of source code uh, under a permissive license and I give it to you and you combine it with your code, uh, then you have very little obligations. Uh, you don't need to release your code. You don't need to release mine. You can modify mine and not uh, publish the modifications. It's very permissive, as the name says. Then we have the weekly reciprocal regime, exemplified by the Mozilla Public License version 2 or LGPL version 3, in which I give you a piece of code uh, licensed under one of these licenses, and uh, you combine it with your work. Uh, when you distribute, for example, a binary based on that combined work, uh, you will need to make the sources of my part available and any modification to those sources as well. Uh, you do. You will not need to publish your part of things, uh, so that can remain proprietary if you wish, or with any other open source license. Um, and then the uh, the third family is a strongly reciprocal set of licenses. Uh, the main exponent is GPL. There is also a Ferro GPL, which is uh, a, a bit more uh, reciprocal or more. Um, uh, kind of caters for use cases where GPL is not effective, in which if I, if I publish a piece of source code uh, and I license it under one of these strongly reciprocal licenses, you combine it with your, with your code and make a binary out of it, when you distribute the binary, you will be expected not only to publish my part and any modifications you did to that, but also your part under the same license, uh, creating a virtual circle of sharing. So, through the years, it has been acknowledged that the different communities have different sensibilities, different constraints, and uh, we have ended up with these three big families of uh, licensing regimes. Now, uh, as I said, uh, we want to take this as a starting point for uh, hardware licensing, and uh, there's a number of reasons why we cannot just take existing software licenses for hardware, in particular in the reciprocal regimes. Uh, and I, I've come up with a short list. Uh, there are more reasons, but these are the main ones, uh, the main issues you find when you try uh, to apply the, directly the concepts of software licensing to hardware designs. The first one is that uh, the rights for hardware uh, are not so clear cut. Uh, today, in software, you can really rely on the fact that source code and binaries are um, are uh, covered by copyright uh, everywhere. In the case of hardware, you have design files, but then you have also the physical objects uh, that you end up uh, manufacturing, constructing. And um, uh, in the general case, copyright does not apply to physical objects. So copyright is not a right you can rely if you're going to attach any obligations to, uh, to something related to these physical objects uh, in principle. Uh, there are other rights uh, that could apply, but uh, certainly the case of copyright for physical objects is problematic. Then, uh, patents are uh, something that's much more central in hardware than in the software world. Uh, they cannot be an afterthought, they cannot be a footnote in a license, they, ha they have to be a first-class citizen in every license. You have to give uh, your licensees permission to use patents if they are going to freely use your design. Then there is a very info uh, the, the very important issue of reciprocity. Uh, so what should reciprocity mean for a hardware design, first of all? So should it mean that when you receive a physical object, uh, you should have the right or the capability to trace back the design files for that object. This is what we believed, and uh, this creates a number of issues I will describe later. And also, uh, something that should be clarified is the scope of reciprocity. Uh, if I take, for example, the case of a computer, a, a mouse, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, designed with designs based on uh, licensed under a, an open hardware license, uh, zooming in and zooming out on that design, I can ask a number of questions. For example, zooming out, if I connect uh, that mouse to a laptop, uh, does that mean that because the mouse is licensed under a reciprocal open hardware license, we should release the design of the laptop as well, or or or, or shouldn't we? And if I go uh, down, zooming in, if I look at the internals of the mouse design, maybe I find a printed circuit board with some resistors in it. Uh, does that mean that we should publish the recipes for making resistors out of carbon and metal uh, because of the re reciprocal obligations? So all these questions of scope of reciprocity need to be answered. And finally, something that is today at least uh, a very important difference between the hardware world and the software world is uh, the, the design ecosystem, the tools. Uh, so there are cases, many cases, in which hardware is designed using proprietary tools. And sometimes part of those tools which are licensed in a proprietary way actually go into the design itself. So I should probably make a, a, open a very small parenthesis here to tell uh, those of you who don't know about digital design something about uh, hardware description languages and, and FPGAs and ASICs. So uh, when you design an application specific integrated circuit, like the, some of the chips you put in a printed circuit board, uh, one of the ways of designing it is writing HDL. So, so these are files which are um, written in, a, in languages we call hardware description languages like VHDL or Verilog. And then through a long process, they will end up uh, generating masks uh, to make wafers and ultimately to become an integrated circuit packaged in a plastic case and soldered on, on top of your PCB or your printed circuit board. Uh, there has been an evolution in the last 20 years to also be able to uh, use uh, the same sources to configure a configurable circuit called a field programmable gate array, so FPGA. And uh, in the case of FPGAs in particular, um, the end binary that configures your circuit will contain very often libraries uh, shipped with the design tools, which are themselves proprietary. Okay, so these proprietary bits end up being part of your design. And of course, the big issue is what to do with them regarding the reciprocal obligations, because there is no way you can produce the sources and, and uh, license them and, uh, under an open source license because uh, they are licensed under a proprietary license by the vendor to begin with. So it, that's impossible and poses a significant problem. Now, some... Um, Let's let's go now uh, to the to the CERN Open Hardware License. And before I tackle uh, these um, list of issues and and I explain how the CERN Open Hardware License deals with each one of them, uh, I have one quick slide on on introductory material about the license. So uh, the uh, the mechanism used by the license is mostly based on rights that apply to the design sources. And by sources we mean, for example, circuit schematics in the case of um, uh, electronics, uh, layouts, or, but also CAD drawings in the case of mechanics and, and so on. So uh, what a designer edits uh, at the first stages of, uh, of, the, uh, of the kind of cycle that ends with the manufacturing of a product. The license specify, specifies conditions for copying designs, modifying designs, uh, distributing the modified or unmodified designs, but also and this sets it apart from software, uh, on making so, uh, the hardware based on those designs and distributing that hardware. It was drafted by Miriam Ayas, who's a legal advisor in the knowledge transfer uh, CERN uh, group, uh, by Andrew Katz, who's an independent consultant who has done a lot of work in this version two, and, and myself. And uh, recognizing, uh, as is the case for software, that there are three big families of, of sharing practices in, in the hardware world as well, uh, we uh, split version two in three variants. So the, the license comes in three variants. Uh, the first one is the permissive one, then there is a weekly reciprocal variant and the strongly reciprocal variant, which have very similar effects, as we will see later, to what I just explained for the case of software. 
So now coming back to the list of issues uh, uh, I enumerated earlier about um, how to apply uh, concepts coming from the software world to the to the hardware world when when coming up with a license. First, the rights uh, for hardware, as I said, copyright uh, does not apply uh, generally to uh, physical objects. So you need sometimes to use other rights and uh, the path we have used or the, the method we have used to make these available to, to license source is that we make no assumption about rights in the text. So it could be copyright in some cases, copyright as applied to the design sources, but it could be any other right. Uh, the world of rights for hardware is not as uniform legally as uh, copyright is for software around the world. So there might be situations uh, uh, in which in a particular country or for a particular type of project, other rights could apply. So we want to make the applicability of the license as broad as possible and to give license source as many chances as, as possible to, um, to uh, use the license for reaching their goals in terms of sharing. So we make no assumption about the underlying rights. Of course, very often it will be copyright as applied to the design source. Regarding patents, we have a, a two-way uh, scheme for patenting, uh, for licensing patents, sorry. Uh, on one side, if I publish a design uh, and uh, license it under uh, the CERN Open Hardware license, any of the variants, uh, there is a clause, there is a, a section that will uh, make sure that I'm promising you that I will not sue you for patent infringe infringement uh, related to the use of this design. Okay, so any of the rights you have by the license you can exercise and you don't have to worry about me uh, suing you for patent infringement. So this is something that's reassuring for the licensee. And then there is the counterpart of that, which is that if a licensee sues a licensor for patent infringement, then he or she will lose all the rights uh, that the uh, license gives them, okay? Uh, so it's a two-way scheme which aims at making sure that everybody enjoys the freedoms afforded by the CERN Open Hardware License, irrespectively of uh, patenting. Regarding reciprocity, this is where Andrew came up with a number of innovative concepts. Um, so uh, I said, what, what do we mean by reciprocity in the hardware world? Um, we, 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 one of the uh, analogies that we make is that the equivalent of a binary in the, uh, which is the end product in the, uh, in the software world would be an object in the hardware world. And we want to have the URL uh, of the design sources available to whoever receives an object. So there is this notion of embedding the URL in the object itself and then the patent protects, uh, the license protects that uh, URL in the sense that it should be kept uh, in, the, in the product and as the product changes hands, there's no risk of that URL being lost. And if people change the sources and modify the design, they should provide a new URL. So the licensor can specify, that that's an option, the, the licensor can specify that that URL be kept in the product. And then for dealing with this zooming out and zooming out, uh, zooming in um, issue of reciprocity scope that I mentioned earlier with the example of the mouse, uh, we have the notions of product and available components. So going, zooming out, uh, the obligations stop at product. Product is whatever you make out of the design files that you license under CERN OHL. In my previous example, it would be the mouse. It's not the laptop because that was not made with CERN OHL license designs. And therefore the obligations stopped at, at that product, at the mouse. If I zoom in and I look at the resistor, uh, we acknowledge the fact that in electronics design and hardware design in general, there are many available components. You go to any electronics distributor and you buy a resistor. And therefore, we, we have this concept of available components and resistors, for example, in a PCB qualify as available components. So you don't need to make the sources available. And then uh, the last issue I mentioned was the hardware design ecosystem and these problems with tools. Uh, we, we reused the concept of available components that had been introduced uh, for the reciprocity scope issue. 
and and we have these proprietary components that sometimes inevitably go in the end design in the end product uh, and we uh, make them qualify as available components so that you don't have an obligation to release the sources for those uh, which anyway is impossible in most of the cases so we we make that uh, part of the license to begin with so there's no issue now uh, let's look at these a bit more graphically. So I have two examples of application of the different variants. Uh, this is for printed circuit board design. So I'm going to uh, walk through this slide from left to right. This is uh, a piece of printed circuit board design and licensed under the OHL. And this is your work. And you want to use this piece of design. So it will find its place in your schematics as a block and in your layout as a piece of layout. And then you have a resulting resi design for the com from the combination of the uh, your work and these um, CERN OHL licensed uh, uh, subpart. Now, depending on which variant the original design was licensed with, the original OHL part was licensed with, your obligations will vary. If, if it was under the permissive variant, your obligations are very, very lightweight, like preserving notices, but you definitely don't need to publish um, the original OHL design or any modification to it, and even less your uh, your part that you your larger design that you you used uh, the OHL component in. If the original OHL design was uh, uh, licensed under the W variant, under the weekly reciprocal one, you will need to publish only that part or any modifications you made to it. But you can still keep the uh, uh, larger design and your contributions proprietary. And if it was uh, licensed under the S variant, then you need to publish the whole thing under the S variant. So this is exactly analogous to uh, what we have seen in the software world. Similarly, if we are speaking about HDL design, so hardware description languages, you're targeting an FPGA or an integrated circuit, uh, an ASIC, uh, it's exactly the same thing. Here's your source code. Here's a piece of OHL licensed VHCL code. You use it in your product project. And then in the final product, uh, if the original bit of HCL licensed under OHL was permissive, there's barely any obligations. If you have, if it was W, you need to make that part available and any modifications to it as well. And if it was S, uh, the whole thing will be need to be released under S. Now, having gone through the license, let me now, for those of you who are experts in uh, in hardware licensing, and give you a selection of three um, uh, of our frequently asked question entries that I considered interesting to uh, trigger debate, maybe. So first of all, this is a, a recurrent question. Of course, many of the printed circuit boards contain a processor or something that can run software. What should people do with the software that's embedded and runs in those processors uh, in terms of licensing? Our recommendation is to use your favorite software license because the licensing regimes of the uh, of the software part of a project and the hardware part are independent. Uh, there are already excellent uh, licenses for all the three types of sharing available in the software world, and I gave the examples um, earlier. And uh, in particular, for uh, reciprocal designs, we would like to avoid something which is called uh, license proliferation, which can be a big issue because in, uh, pro in reciprocal license, uh, licensing, uh, if I have two licenses which are reciprocal, like license A and license B, and I want to combine works that are licensed under each one of those licenses, so I combine a piece of, a, uh, uh, a piece of design under A and uh, a piece of design under B, uh, the combination by virtue of A should be licensed under A, and the combination by virtue of the uh, B license should be licensed under B, which is uh, a contradiction and sometimes can, can create problems. And historically, it has created problems. This is an acknowledged issue uh, of reciprocal licensing, and uh, it is frowned upon to come up with new reciprocal licenses, which are incompatible with the existing set and in particular with the GPL which is a de facto standard for this licensing regime so we don't want to contribute to the license proliferation issue in the software world uh, and therefore we, we don't recommend uh, for, for software the use of these reciprocal variants of the license having said that there is the HDL case 
that uh, which sometimes we call gateware to have a, a, a word which is not software and uh, and for that case people have traditionally used uh, software licenses and, and we believe that they are not appropriate for a number of reasons uh, some of which have to do with these um, uh, design tool ecosystem i alluded to earlier so for hdl for gateway uh, we really recommend the use of uh, cern ohl in particular if you want to choose one of the reciprocal variants for your project So another question is how effective are these reciprocity provisions and are there types of designs which are less well covered? And the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is that because we rely on, uh, on rights, on things that in principle people should not have the right to do to attach these obligations of sharing back, uh, designs which are not very much connected objects which are not very much connected to design sources are poorly protected by this mechanism okay so if 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 you if the object that you want to license is just something you made with your hands with no design behind it and if your object uh, when it comes to modifications it's also kind of modified by hand and you don't need to modify the design sources uh, it's going to be more tricky than the case in which uh, a modification of your object requires a modification of the design sources which will necessarily infringe copyright and from that you can hook a number of obligations. So depending on the type of object you're concerned with in your project, the reciprocity provisions will be uh, more or less enforceable and this is important to bear in mind. Uh, and finally a question uh, which uh, is related to the uh, proliferation issue, the license proliferation issue I alluded to earlier. Uh, are the reciprocal variants of CERN OHL v2 compatible with GPL? Essentially, when you make a license compatible with GPL, what you're saying is that you give the freedom to the, to the licensee to interpret the design as being licensed under GPL. And because there is this freedom, then it can be combined with other GPL material and the resulting uh, design can be licensed under GPL as required by the GPL. Uh, in principle, it, it is a question and it is a big issue. It's a, it's a big deal to decide if a reciprocal license is compatible with GPL or not because of these license proliferation issues I, I explained earlier. In our case, uh, it was a tough decision, but we decided not to make it compatible. Uh, for a very simple reason. We, as, as I said, we explored what uh, reciprocity should mean for hardware, and in our case, we wanted to make sure that the objects, uh, the recipient of, a pro, uh, of an object has the way, a way to trace back the design files, and we came up with this mechanism for embedding a URL and making sure that's respected. If we gave the licensee the option of interpreting the design as, um, as GPL, which does not have this clause, uh, then we would be providing an easy escape to these obligations and others. So uh, we decided that uh, we would not make the reciprocal, the reciprocal variants of the license compatible with GPL. So to conclude, a quick recap. Uh, we have drafted version 2 of the CERN OHL with as a main objective to, provi to provide a sound legal basis to share uh, open hardware designs in, in an effective way. Acknowledging the fact that there are three main uh, sharing methods or regimes out there, we split the license this time in three variants, permissive, weekly reciprocal, and strongly reciprocal. So CERN OHL is a one-stop shop for licensing any kind of hardware. There was a strong effort devoted to dealing with the big world of HDL, FPGA, and ASIC design, uh, which in our opinion was not well covered by existing reciprocal license in the software world. So uh, we made a special effort to make sure that the W and S variants are applicable to HDL designs, whether they are targeting FPGAs or ASICs. And the CERN OHL is a community project itself. It is, uh, there's a forum, people come up with suggestions. There has been quite a, a lot of traffic lately, uh, questions. So you are very much welcome to contribute 
uh, and to get involved uh, in any way you like. So if you're interested in getting more information, the, the license texts themselves, uh, are, are a document with the rationale of why we took uh, a number of decisions in the drafting, uh, an extensive list of frequently asked questions and the forum, they are all in this URL here. And uh, with that, I will open the floor for questions and debate. Thank you.